keep I cannot can't hear a word he said. Is there anything gone? Harry says Sandy went to switch. Yeah. I don't Okay. Um oh, hang on just There's thirteen people on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess to do, yeah. Well, we want to read from Psalms 95, 1 to 7. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And we are told to also remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all them and all that in them is and rest of the seventh day wherefore the word blessed the sabbath day and then he hallowed it amen So, Sandy, are you ready for Dean to start? Yes. I am my mute on. Go ahead, Dean. Okay. I need a little coaching again on, uh, is it share screen? Yeah, you have to have it open and put on your taskbar down below first. And then when you push uh, share screen, you'll see the program you want to share with everybody and then click on it. Got it. There you go. Okay. Now, if I want to uh, get rid of the, uh, the strip with uh, all the, the people there so I can see my, uh, my screen, Eric, you know how to do this? Go up to the go up. up in the far right corner. Okay, Dink, got Thank it. You. you can put a speaker or whatever. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let me know when you want to get started. We'll have a word of prayer and um, we can get underway. We're ready. Okay, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to open and share your word and also see how it ties in with the events that are taking place all around us. Um, we know that your word is relevant, uh, not only throughout history and um, to the first and uh, all the way through the second advent. And we ask that you would please bless with the power of your spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth and uh, help us to know through your grace, through your spirit, again, how to relate to the things that we see around us and to be useful to you in your service all the way through to the end. But we do thank you again and thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Dean Farrell, of course, Second Advent Herald. And what I wanted to look at is... Uh, an interesting topic that's uh, been on my mind off and on quite a bit more lately. It's called the morality of walls and borders. <clears throat> and this will be part one. 
And uh, with the things that are taking place all around us, uh, there's, there's more uh, to it than meets the eye as well. But I have an opening text, a couple actually, uh, Jeremiah chapter 21, verses four through six. It says, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, wherewith you fight against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans, which besiege you without the walls. And I will assemble them into the midst of this city, and I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and with a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will smite the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. Now, I know that wasn't, <clears throat> pardon me, a chipper cheery uh, passage, but as we look at the principles that um, we will here, we see some parallels between America and also Israel of old. And Isaiah 49, verse 16 and 17. Here's something a little bit more positive. It says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers, <clears throat> and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Amen. And one more, Zechariah chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. It says, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be <clears throat> the glory in the midst of her. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwells with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory has he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you, for he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Are you the apple of his eye? <clears throat> uh, has he graven you upon the palms of his hands? Um, There's some positive that's in this, but we also want to look at um, all sides of this issue, uh, both sides of the wall, so to speak. And What I want to do, again, is look at uh, recent and current events, and uh, we're going to look at the need of morality um, or the morality of secure borders and walls, and I want to go through biblical histories and biblical promises and prophecies and even theologies relating <clears throat> to building moral walls and tearing down immoral walls. And so I want to start with some fairly uncomfortable current things, but you know, for the last few years, we've heard from the academics and the universities and Black Lives Matter, Antifa, even radical illegal aliens uh, in the street shouting, defund the police, abolish ICE, no border, no walls, no USA at all. You've heard those chants over the last few years. And all this while they're burning courthouses, immigration, ICE and police stations, and they're looting their businesses in their own hometown, sadly. And then some get imported into other towns. I won't go into too much of that. But they assault anyone and everyone who has a dissenting viewpoint uh, or opinion, or if you happen to be in the path um, of some of these things in some of our cities. And I call it anarcho-Marxism. And the sad thing is that it, it seems to resonate with World Economic Forum uh, policies, the papacy, the UN, and of course, the sad thing is our mainstream media. And you see the, the fruit of it in our blue or sanctuary cities. And what is really interesting is the uh, Department of Justice and the present occupiers of Washington, D.C. seem to give the people who are doing these things a pass. And you wonder, what is going on? It seems that justice is absolutely inverted. And it is. And there was a debate a few years back where the man who now is an occupier of the White House said that day one of his administration, there should be a surge at the southern border. And there was a surge at the southern border. And we know from looking at these different colored bracelets that these hordes of people that were coming up um, were brought in by drug cartels, which we know um, have uh, been backed by the Chinese Communist Party. And um, that surge at the southern border, well, the drug cartels, the human traffickers and narcotics traffickers, they all agree. And there was the surge and it continues to surge. 
But interestingly, as I mentioned before, it seems to resonate with certain organizations. Um, one who uh, abides in the Vatican said that Christians don't build walls. And um, also we saw a wall going up all around our Capitol. And um, from within that Capitol building, there were people that were saying that border walls are immoral. So again, we're looking at the morality of walls and we're gonna look at a few fairly painful subjects. Um, if you wanna research this, this is an older report from 2021. It's a um, Media for Humanity blog. And um, again, it was from uh, 2021 and they have pictures of what's called rape trees. And I'll just read some of the report. Recently, a UN report found that nearly 70% of all females crossing the border without a male guardian are sexually assaulted, mainly by their coyote or person hired to lead them across. According to sheriffs, border control groups, and Americans residing on the border, many coyotes make the abused girls hang their undergarments on trees to exacerbate their shame. These trees are disgusting trophies, which coyotes use to compete against each other. Uh, many quote unquote rape trees, uh, as these trees have come to be called, display dozens of undergarments, which are commonly found ripped or torn because many of the victims are violently gang raped. And this is uncomfortable stuff, but ignoring it isn't gonna make it go away going back to the article, but perhaps the most heart-wrenching aspect of this barbaric evidence is the sight of small children's underwear and training bras, signifying the sexual abuse of young girls. This violence and despicable practice must stop now. Regardless of their legal status, these rapes are occurring on our soil. So on our side of a very porous border, and probably the one that made me the angriest I just saw in the last few days that a raped eight year old migrant girl had 67 DNA samples inside her. She was unable to talk. Um, <clears throat> it, um, it gets to me. And uh, this just is not uh, misplaced compassion. Uh, for people that are seeking asylum here, there's something very sinister going on and it's, and it's known by people in power. And there seems to be very little, if not nothing, being done about it. Um, so what if, again, I wanna look at this on a national level. And first I'd like to take from our uh, Creator Redeemer's words in Luke 17 verses one and two. He said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now that's on a personal level, on an individual level. What if it takes place on a national level? Would you say that a nation that allows this, that does not do all they can to stop it, would be howling for judgments. And we are, friends, we are. Uh, I know I've commented on um, an Angel um, Studios production not too long ago. Uh, I don't care for some of the things that are behind The Chosen. Um, but this particular video uh, that I wanna show you a trailer of was put together, um, but they couldn't find um, companies that would actually put it out there, but it's going to be released July 4th. And um, Angel Productions took it. And, um, you know, even a broken clock can be right twice a day. So I wanna just watch this just for a moment.
No, I don't need to go on, but um, I used to support a, a group of uh, Christians. I believe it was called Veterans for Child Rescue. And they got attacked by different uh, media agencies and also credit card companies where they got defunded. You couldn't even support them. And it has come to our shores. You don't have to go to Brazil or any place else to find them. And you find it in Revelation chapter 18, where you see that the merchandise uh, goes from gold and silver and down the line until it comes to the bodies and souls and slaves of men. And we're there. And there's a, a millstone that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 18 for Babylon. Um, but we have an amazing level of complicity in this country with various levels of uh, the Department of Justice, whether it be Hollywood, you just go down, it's pervasive throughout our society. And we're, this is another sign of the times that we are definitely, definitely in big trouble as a nation. And, uh, you know, without going on, that's going to be released July 4th. And I have this strange thing in me that makes me very defensive of um, old people and children, and it just drives me crazy when they get abused. Um, but there's millions of them, and it's happening right here in America. And we not only need to be in prayer, but we need to actually pray for those people that are willing to step up and do something about it, if you don't mind me saying that. Um, but that's not the only trafficking that's going on. We've got uh, government, corporate government, uh, pharma, media interests that are coercing people, coercing our citizens. Um, they built walls, so to speak, around dissenters while undocumented migrants were welcomed in virtually unrestricted. And if I have my numbers correct, close to 5 million since uh, the occupier of the uh, of DC has taken office. Uh, and many of those came with uh, documents, turned themselves in, while many, many more were coming in with loads of narcotics or bringing other things into the United States. Um, this is taking place all around us. And uh, again, there's human and narcotics traffickers that are just pouring through porous borders. Um, so dealing with this prophetically, I want to look at Revelation 18, uh, verse 12 and 13, and then I'll skip to verse 23. But uh, as we look at this merchandise or traffic that Babylon, uh, it's everything from gold and silver. And then it says down to the slaves and souls of men. Um, verse 23, very familiar passage for us over the past few years. It says, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And of course, from Strong's 5331, uh, that's pharmakia, the use of or the administering of drugs, poisoning, magical arts, often in connection with idolatry. Now, the reason I bring this up for some of you know my testimony for about 20 years of my life, I was involved with uh, narcotics, not only personal voodoo <laughs> using the needle, but I was also involved with people that were wholesaling. Uh, involved with some cartel type people. They just called them familia back then. Um, but I saw, and I thought that that text applied to that, but it's not only that. But when we consider who makes the drugs, who supplies uh, raw chemicals, I know that when I was involved with methamphetamine and manufacturing in um, Southern California, that the, the Mexican... Uh, groups that took over and were killing off white cooks were actually being supplied uh, with the ephedra from the communist Chinese that was well known among us there. And so if it was known among us, it was also known among law enforcement. But it's, um, it's global, friends, this is a big deal. And when we consider who makes the drugs and the unscrupulous politicians and propaganda media that's bent their energies to over the last few years, we saw citizens locked down or locked out, businesses closed, uh, collapsed economies, supply chains. Um, you can look at how that's affected the world. Um, the numbers of people that have starved to death because uh, what happens in the first world affects the third world. Um, this isn't just here, but 
while all these things were taking place, um, we had open borders and sanctuary cities that were wide open and the increase of the illicit drugs uh, and cartel activities on both sides of the border were being allowed to take place. Um, December 6, 2018, the Speaker of the House said that additional barrier construction would be immoral still, even if the Mexican government paid for it. On January 3rd, the same person said, a wall is an immorality. It is not who we are as a nation. You see, friends, a nation without borders is not a nation. Great Controversy, page 442, says the speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. By such, act, such action, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles which it has put forth as the foundation of its policy. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast plainly foretells a development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution. Um, it is amazing the things that have been taking place in this country um, really for the last 20 years, but everything has sped up exponentially in the last few. And from third volume of uh, Selected Messages, page 338, and I'm gonna start moving in more into the, uh, the history prophetic nature. It says, each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours so that their prophesying is enforced for us are they excuse me and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come not unto themselves but unto us did they minister the things which are now reported unto you so uh we saw this taking place in europe um with a major push of islamic immigration um people that did not assimilate uh, they didn't love the country or even appreciate the countries that they were flooding into. Uh, and we see it in post-Christian America. It's called anarcho-communism, and it's fully supported by Rome. And I believe it's incurring judgments uh, for generally putting up a wall between us and the true God. Is it possible? Um, yes, it most certainly is. But uh, I see this as um, a reminder of the corrective judgments on apostate Israel and Judah and surrounding nations. And um, so what I wanna do is we're looking at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're gonna do bad news to conditional good news to very good news and know that uh, prophecy and history repeats, or sad to say, um, we repeat history. So let's look at prophecy right now. Isaiah chapter 10, verses one through six, and I abbreviated this a bit, but it says, woe well unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and to take away the right from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey and rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which shall come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? Verse four, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners. And verse six tells us, I will send him against an hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Well, that doesn't sound like good news, does it? Well, you know, when uh, this took place, um, those were preparations for a judgment which took them into 70 years of captivity. But this was um, a corrective judgment. And I would say, personally, just looking at it, that we've done worse than Israel and Judah. And there is a lot of spirit of prophecy that parallels our uh, commission and our failure to carry out that commission with Israel. And we've actually been blessed with more. But continuing on in Isaiah 10, uh, verse 11 through 22, again, I've abbreviated it. But it says, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem? And I would just like to add the USA, because the one with whom we have to do changes not. He shows no shadow of turning. In him is no variableness at all. 
And we are involved with the grossest idolatry in America. Verse 13, for he saith, by the strength of my hand. Now, this is the, um, the powers that be in our time. By the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, I have removed the bounds. And that word bounds in Hebrew uh, is 1367. I don't have it in the Hebrew language, but it means borders. I have removed the borders of the people and have robbed their treasures. Verse 14, and my hand has found as a nest the riches of the people and as one gathers eggs that are left. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. Now, before I go on with the rest of that, how afraid are the citizens, we the people, how afraid have we generally become of the powers that be, especially since January 6th? Uh, especially since that you can be deplatformed, defunded, uh, silenced, uh, censored. Uh, we have to be very careful. Um, and they're training us not to peep. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if they can train you not to speak, then they have trained your mind. It's mind control. Now, whose job description is that? Since where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 16, therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, that means armies, the Lord of Saba, uh, it says it shall come to pass in verse 20 that in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant shall return, that means repent. 7725, the word in Hebrew is in the strong, 7725, they shall return or repent unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. That means repent. Not only return to the land from which they were taken captive, but even repent. It says this, the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. Ah, so we see a ray of hope. Uh, what about us in the last days? Among those who have called themselves the remnant church, only a remnant of that remnant will be saved and repent. And we can look around us, uh, not only in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but around Christianity in general. And it seems that the church doesn't make a peep. Um, when we should be the ones, uh, Protestants should have an effectual protest, especially be in prayer, but oftentimes we don't even want to look at the issues. They're too uncomfortable for us to deal with, and so we hide our heads. But there's a paradox as we start looking at borders. By saying that borders and walls are racist and they're an immorality, quote unquote, uh, what does that say of the ultimate originator of borders and walls? I wanna look at that. This is kind of a spin on it, but I think it's a righteous spin. Um, border walls are designed for the purpose of being a sign of sovereignty and they're instruments of safety for the inhabitants that are within those walls by keeping enemies out. So visitors or migrants coming through the ports of entry are reasonably required to abide within the laws of the city or state. The ultimate establisher of order and border walls is God and he is love. Is he a racist? Is he hateful? Is he immoral? No, he's neither one of those things, but he seeks immigrants to inhabit the new Jerusalem. He's seeking immigrants, right? He's not a racist, yet he's only going to allow his own children, tribal members of Israel, and we can become Israel. It costs quite a bit to graft us in. It costs a lot of blood. Tribal members of Israel, and they're only going to be granted if it's orderly entry into his sanctuary city, the New Jerusalem. Yet all, even those who might right now be worthless enemies, they're invited in because he wants to give us a transformation. And by the way, friends, this is a strict merit-based immigration plan, and he supplies the merit. He wants us in there. He wants to make us to get into that city, but there is not gonna be one undocumented or illegal alien, if I may play with words, is gonna be permitted. 
will be documented. Only those that are going to be delivered will be found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, slain from the foundation of the world. So we know by reading Revelation 20 that uh, attempts at illegal entry are going to be met with eternal death by fire, right? And yet God is love. Is he a racist? Is he immoral? Is he trying to be exclusive? No, he's trying to win the worst of the worst into that city. But we have to follow the laws. And I don't think that's too much to ask, do you? God is love. Uh, as I alluded to there in Revelation chapter 20, we're going to look at a little word picture of what happens to the illegal aliens who try to come in after the second resurrection. It says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the fire. So it pays to be documented. It pays to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Because remember, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have right to enter in through the gates of the city and partake of the tree of life, by the way. So, friends, as we look at this, the ultimate walled destination that we are seeking, and it is a walled destination, is only entered into by cooperation with Messiah's merit-based immigration plan. And I would say it would do good for us to apply today for refugee status or asylum, right? Apply today. Today is the day of salvation. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So if there's anything that could exclude you from being found written in that book, um, we need to deal with that. And he gives us grace to do that very thing. So again, that ultimate walled destination, let's take another look in Revelation 21, verses 10 through 24. Uh, that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, and verse 12 says, and it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the east, on the north, on the south and on the west, three gates and a wall, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he talked, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And he measured the wall thereof and 140 and four cubits. Verse 18 says, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and into it. So there's that great walled destination that we all see. And in chapter 22, verse 13 through 15, it says, who can be in and who will be ruled out? I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. Now notice that, whosoever loves and makes a lie. You mean a person who's deceived, who loves that lie? So when you think about it, um, there are those that seek to nail to the cross, the commandments, the statutes, and judgments. Um, will those be legal or illegal aliens? Would those who are not having the experience of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and him writing his covenant in our hearts and minds and giving us his spirit that we may walk in them, uh, will they be admitted if we don't have that experience? So if we subscribe to a theology that says, yes, we're saved in sin, not from sin, uh, you will be outside. You will be one of those who loves. And if you repeat it, you make a lie. Um, it pays to love the truth, doesn't it? 
So apparently these great impenetrable walls and gates are moral. And who's going to be the protesters outside saying no borders, no walls, no New Jerusalem at all? Well, we know what happens to them. And they're accusing their maker of them being unloving or racist, only allowing in Israel. And by the way, I, I did mention the 12 gates, but what I didn't mention was the pearls. And that, that just came to mind when you think about how a pearl is made. Uh, it comes from a great deal of pain and irritation to the uh, creature that forms the pearl. And I believe that without tribulation, no man shall enter into that city. So we are going to see trouble. We're going to see pain. But even as we take up our cross and follow our master and follow him, um, yeah, there's going to be trouble. So I want to take a truthful look at the future of walls and that for um, some at first, this is not going to be the easiest thing to receive. Um, but as we look in Bible history, biblical history, borders were established, walls and fence cities were built and never considered immoral, except to God's enemies and the enemies of his people. Um, Solomon, in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 8 and verse 5, it says that he built fence cities and walls and gates and bars. Now, you know, we need to consider, are they meant to keep people in or are they meant to keep enemies out? Uh, Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 2 through 7. Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Oh, that's a relief. When you read uh, First and Second Kings and Chronicles, how many times we see that he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. But Asa did differently. Verse 3, it says, for he took away the altars of the strange gods. Do we have altars of strange gods in America? In more ways than one. Verse 4, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of his fathers or their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. Verse 5 says, and the kingdom was quiet before him, and he built. Now, this is when it was quiet before him. Notice this. And he built fence cities. And he had no war in those years. You see, when it's known that you have borders, you have walls, you have fence cities, and you're ready to defend them, you don't have war. It says, because the Lord had given him rest. Now, did he do it because he didn't fear the Lord? Or did he do it because that's what he was supposed to do? Well, verse 7, it says, Therefore he said unto Judah, let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers and gates and bars. So they built and prospered. Built and prospered. <clears throat> to me, it's uncomfortable when I think about what's going on with our walls. What about Uzziah? Second Chronicles 26, verses 3 and 9. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. In verse 4, it says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. In verse 9, moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem, and he built a wall and fortified them. Is it wrong to defend your land and call for power from on high to defend your land? Did God give us this land? Now, some would say, uh, especially in the universities and uh 1619 project, people that go along with the woke CRT uh, will say, no, this country was founded on slavery. And uh, look at what they did to the Native Americans. And uh, OK, well, let's go back uh, with the covenant that was made with Abraham. Uh, Abram at the time, um, what was he supposed to do when the iniquity of the Amorites was full, and when 430 years later to the very same day, which happened to be Passover, by the way, uh, what were they to do um, to certain kingdoms who had passed the line of divine forbearance? Well, we know why they became thorns in their side. They didn't complete the work that they were called to do. But Second Chronicles, we're going to look at Manasseh, um, kind of a I would say one whose name lives in the hall of shame. Uh, Second Chronicles, he actually repented. 
uh, 33, 11 through 16, again, I've abbreviated it, but it says the king of uh, Syria took Manasseh to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly. Now, just imagine Manasseh, one of the worst of the worst. But he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly. If there was hope for Manasseh, is there hope for us? If we avail ourselves of the help that's offered in the hope, yes. And he was entreated of him and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Now, after this, he built a wall without the city of David, and he raised it up a very great height, and he put captains of war in all the fenced cities. Verse 15 says, and he took away the strange gods and the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. Now, could there be a parallel in America or is it too late? And what does it require? It requires more than a, a reawakening. It requires more than a revival. It requires a, a reformation. And many are going to get involved with a false revival and a false reformation. And we know that that's going to have anything and everything to do with worship times and laws that you and I hold dear. Um, but there are people that can be reached. If Manasseh can be reached, there are still some of these people that we need to work to try to reach before it's too late. But I believe that the, the order that we just looked at is very interesting. Manasseh, again, was one of the worst of the kings who did evil in the sight of the Lord. He humbled himself greatly, returned, repented. Then he built very high walls and prepared for war and cast out all his old false gods and altars. I find that order very interesting. Uh, borders and walls can be good, but not all walls are, such as uh, the Berlin Wall. The motives were then to keep people in that would have been blessed if they could have gotten out. But the motives are what they're built for and fortified to keep in or out determines the morality of the wall. And uh, again, just looking at the situation at hand. so. Prophecy here, what we want to look at is what would happen to a good wall when those within it became immoral. Uh, Isaiah 5, and I was just studying this this morning, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. And this is a song of a vineyard. It says, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it. And he gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. Did he have any reason to believe it could bring forth good grapes? He planted it with the choicest vine. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones. That would be those tribes that were supposed to be displaced in order to give them the place in Canaan. And he planted it with the choices. Who said that? Who inspired that to be said? The choices, fine. Can we start out good and end up terribly? He said he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between or betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? What more could he do? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Now, at this particular time of the year, what are we thinking about when it comes to the clouds and the rain? And what is it that we're looking for? What is it that we need that he wants to pour on his vineyard, upon his people? Don't we need the outpouring of his spirit and the infilling? You know, we think of Pentecost and what it's all about, what it's to accomplish, to bring a harvest to readiness. And not only to bring a harvest to readiness, but as we're filled with that, what will we do in our commission? 
but Israel failed of its ancient Israel. It says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now, from Isaiah's time, they were taken into that 70-year captivity, and they were released, and they built again, and that city was destroyed. So we see prophecy and history, and now as we look at Israel engrafted and some of the natural, um, if we fail to uphold the commission that he's given us, what can we expect? So I want to look at when they were released from captivity, repentance and rebuilding the moral wall, and who was it to keep in or out? So Nehemiah, we look at chapter 4, verse 1, 2, and then we'll do 17 and 18, again, selected parts. When Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked. Are there Sanballats in our time when a wall was being built? Verse two, what do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? In verse 17, they which build it on the wall, every one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. And so they built at whose command. And so let's look at prophets and kings, 677, 678. The spiritual restoration of which the work carried forward in Nehemiah's day was a symbol. And I supplied the word that describes a people who, in a time of general departure from truth and righteousness, are seeking to restore the principles that are the foundation of the kingdom of God. They are repairs of a breach that was made in God's law. The wall, the what? It says the wall that he has placed around his chosen ones for their protection and obedience to whose precepts of justice, truth, and purity is to be their perpetual safeguard. In words of unmistakable meaning, the prophet points out the specific work of this remnant people to build the wall. In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. Now, every means more than one, wouldn't you say? Can we agree with that? Um, divine institution. Are there any divine institutions that uh, Roman uh, elements, be it pagan or papal, have taken away? Um, actually, the power of the beast and the whore have taken from the worship of the lamb. And yet there is to be an a people that are going to be restoring every divine institution. I'm glad I'm speaking to some of you. Um, I want to encourage you. And I pray that you'll pray for me. Because what is it that he had as a commission for his people? Um, let's look at Isaiah 60 and verse 10. It says, the sons of the strangers shall build up thy walls. For in my wrath, I smote you. But in my favor, I have had mercy on you. The sons of the stranger. We'll look at that a little bit more. But there are those that uh, once we become grafted into Israel, we are part of the plant receiving of the root uh, and will bear the fruit if we're attached. And so he's called us to join him in covenant connection. So covenant converts from among the Gentiles shall help build the wall. And what is that wall in these last days? Remember, we just looked at it. It was the precepts of justice, truth, and purity that are to be a perpetual safeguard. And so we want to be about the business of restoring. And um, so let's look at that a little bit more. Um, you know, when we see that walls can be good, but not all walls are good, uh, the motives for making them, it determines everything, really. Uh, Israel's commission was to help. They were to be a light to those that sit in darkness. But how did their report card look in respect to that? Um, their commission was to help qualify more to enter into the new Jerusalem, yet their motives got skewed and they ended up erecting their own wall and modifying God's wall, the law. And they did this with their own stones and untempered mortar of traditions of men that so obscured the Messiah's immigration plan that 
they could go from sea to sea, from east to west, and make one proselyte and make him twice the son of Hellas themselves. That's what happens when we bring in <laughs> traditions that are not of the Torah. And, well, we know how that works out. So God's answer was to send his prophets uh, to help correct them. And then he sent his son who commissioned more gospel workers with the way into the 12 gates of the city. And that also has been passed down to us. And that describes this work that we are to be about. But anciently in Isaiah 56, I'm going to read verse 1, 3, and then we'll bring it up into verse 7. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice for my salvation. That's interesting word salvation there. It's pronounced Yeshua, and that's 3444 in the Strong's, for my salvation is near to come. And notice who's inclusive. I'm not talking about, um, well, it's inclusive theology. Um, he includes the stranger in verse three that has joined himself to the Lord. And verse five says, even to them will I give in my house and within my walls, there's that word again, walls, a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, Yehovah, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. Now, before I finish with verse seven, how many people can you talk to in the regular churches uh, about the covenant and what's included in the covenant and what was taken out and nailed? Hard to take hold of something that you nailed to the cross, isn't it? Verse 7. Theologically, it doesn't actually get there. Uh, verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. You see, this isn't replacement theology. What this is, is inclusive theology. And if we end up replaced, it's only because we neglected so great a salvation. Uh, or replaced it with untempered mortar and traditions. Isaiah 26, verses 1 and 2. And here's a, a nice uh, bookend to that first vineyard song that ended in an ignominious way in uh, Isaiah chapter 5, that first song of the vineyard. But I love this one. Isaiah 26, 1 and 2. It says, in that day, this song shall be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, salvation. There it is again. Yeshua will appoint, or will God appoint for walls and bulwarks? So, who's your wall and bulwarks? Yeshua. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps the truth, may enter in. The righteous nation, which keeps the truth, may enter in. How important is the truth? not only to have intellectually, but to be settled into spiritually and intellectually to love the truth, not just have an appreciation. We're not just in a book club. But again, the nature of the walls is determined by the motives for making them and for putting on Christ, who is our bulwark, our strength. Um, here's another witness. Um, <clears throat> this is John 1, 11 through 13. And actually, this passage was a pivotal point for me when I was uh, first studying the Bible in prison. It says, he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Is that applying to you? And can it, if it hasn't yet? You know, he came to his first people, the people he first gave the commission to, and they received him not. But as many as received him, to them gives he power to become, if I may add, the sons and daughters of God. Even to them that believe on his name. And Matthew 121 says, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin, which were born 
not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. It's God's will that we be born again. Can we pray according to that? <laughs> Amen, we can, and we know that he'll hear us. We have confidence in that. James 1, 17 and 18 says, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us, of what? His own will begat he us with the word of truth. Who is that word? Isn't that Yeshua? That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. And Romans 8, 3, 4, and 9. Why did he send his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh? It's, it tells us, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But ye are not, in verse 9, in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Whoa, that's potent, especially when you think of somebody outside the door going, especially those that feel that they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and he's outside. If any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But thank heavens that he is knocking on our door. He only asks us to let him in. So once the disciples really understood, uh, they set about showing all the way into the city. And, you know, if you remember, I think we talked about this last week a little bit. Um, without the uh, abilities that we have, the different tools of uh, electronic communication where we can communicate around the world. And I'm very grateful for that, but they didn't have it. It was an illegal religion, both in Israel or in Judah um, and also in the Roman Empire. And yet they could take that way into that walled city to every creature which is under heaven. And they did it without planes, trains, and automobiles. They did it without electronic communication. They did it with every conceivable and lethal threat against them. Acts of the Apostles, page 19 and 20 reads, the disciples were to go forth as Christ's witnesses to declare to the world what they had seen and heard of him, to be workers together with God for the saving of men. As in the Old Testament, the 12 patriarchs stood as representatives of Israel, so the 12 apostles stand as representatives of the gospel church. During his earthly ministry, Christ began to break down the partition wall. Ah, there's another wall. Is it a moral or an immoral wall? Okay, he began to break down the partition wall between Jew and Gentile and to preach salvation to all mankind. Though he was a Jew, he mingled freely with the Samaritans, setting at naught the Pharisaic customs of the Jews with regard to this despised people. He slept under their roofs, he ate at their tables, and taught in their streets. The Savior longed to unfold to his disciples the truth regarding the breaking down of the middle wall of partition. Ah, so some walls need to be broken down, don't they? The middle wall of partition between Israel and other nations. The truth that, quote, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and quote, with the Jews and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That's from Ephesians 2.14 and 3.6. This truth was revealed in part at the time when he rewarded the faith of the centurion at Capernaum. Still more plainly was it revealed on the occasion of his visit to Phoenicia when he healed the daughter of the Canaanite woman. These experiences helped the disciples to understand that among those whom many regarded as unworthy of salvation, there were souls hungering for the light of truth. Has anybody been out there recently? We see um, Thick darkness enveloping much of the world, but there's also a hungering and thirsting after the truth now that I've never seen before the last two or three years. Continuing, thus Christ sought to teach the disciples the truth that in God's kingdom there are no territorial lines, no caste, no aristocracies, that they must go to all nations, bearing to them the message of a Savior's love. But not until uh, later did they realize in its all its fullness that God hath made of one blood all nations for men of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed. 
buzzwords there, the times before appointed, and that the bounds of their habitation, that they should that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. That was from Acts 17, 26, and 27. Acknowledgement that Jesus took down the wall of exclusivity came with difficulty. With what? Difficulty. Now, that was a problem with the disciples then. Could it be a problem with disciples today? Well, with difficulty, it can come down, but that's one wall that has to. Acts of the Apostles, we're going to read from page 402, 403 this time. The men who, while numbered among those who were in charge of the work at Jerusalem, had urged arbitrary measures of control to be adopted, saw Paul's ministry in a new light and were convinced that their own course had been wrong, that they had been held in bondage by Jewish customs and traditions, and that the work of the gospel had been greatly hindered by their failure to recognize that the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile had been broken down by the death of Christ. That's good news. This was the golden opportunity for all the leading brethren to confess frankly that God had wrought through Paul and that at times they had erred in permitting the report of his enemies to arouse their jealousy and prejudice. So it's good. They found that they were opposing the work that they should have been done and in time, it looks like. But um this is from Signs of the Times, August 25th, 1887. It says, at the first advent of Christ into this world, the people were favored with a new and fuller manifestation of the divine presence than they had ever enjoyed before. The knowledge of God and the infinite love and benevolence of his character were revealed more perfectly, for it pleased the Father that in his well-beloved Son all fullness should dwell. The middle wall of partition, there it is again, the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile was broken down, and both were made partakers not only of the blessings promised under the old covenant, but also the spiritual and heavenly truths revealed through Christ. The Jewish church, Jewish church with its rites and ceremonies pointing forward to Christ, now this is where we ought to step lightly, many people don't, was not to be despised. This was a dispensation of glory. Now, I'm going to interrupt that quote. Many people call it weak and beggarly elements. <laughs> it says, was not to be despised. This was a dispensation of glory. In the wilderness, Christ himself, through, though invisible, was the leader of the armies of Israel, and the power of God was often revealed in a special manner in their behalf. Considering these glorious displays of divine power, Moses thus addressed Israel. What nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God and all these things we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? How many pass over these words of Moses as though they were meaningless and continue to heap reproach and derision on divine institutions? How many trample on the divine law, the righteous judgments and statutes, which were committed to God's ancient people. Hmm. Every divine institution is to be restored, but many trample on these righteous judgments and statutes, which were committed to God's ancient people. We're not to continue to trample on those, but he wants us to restore those that are moral. Um, <clears throat> Signs of the Times, October 17th, 1895. Priests and rulers had interposed themselves between the people and God, and they sought to interpose between them and the great teacher, even as they do in this day. Think about that. How great will be the responsibility of men who seek to hinder souls from entering into the kingdom of heaven? The whole tenor of Christ's teaching was contrary to that of the rabbis. In his Sermon on the Mount, he tore away the middle wall of partition, there it goes again, the middle wall of partition that separated men one from another through national prejudices, and taught the exercise of a love that was to embrace the human race. Hmm. 
That's a good slogan, embrace the human race. He said to the people, you have heard that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Does that come naturally or does it have to come supernaturally? Absolutely, supernaturally. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Christ teaches that we are to recognize our neighbor in every race and condition of men. No distinction is to be made as to who is our neighbor on the grounds of poverty or wealth or position. The followers of Christ are to see their neighbor in anyone who needs their help. All ye are brethren. The Lord has not established a kingdom merely for the rich, and the one essential thing for an entrance into his kingdom is Christ-likeness of character. Tall order, but who says, let me in? <laughs> it can be done, and it is his will, and we can pray according to his will and have confidence that he hears us. Isn't that true? So I kind of want to end part one um, with that. We see there is uh, morality in immoral walls and borders, and um, sometimes we set them up in the name of religion. And um, Yeshua came to tear down that middle wall of partition. And we're not talking about um, replacement theology so far. What we've seen is inclusive theology. And if we're replaced, well, um, we chose to be. Uh, Isaiah 49, 16 and 17. Again, it says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers, and they that made thee way shall go forth of thee. There's going to be a winnowing out, friends. We call it the shaking and the sifting. Um, our worst enemies in these last times will be from within our own members or numbers. Um, but again, I just want to close with this opening text. There's, there's light in it. Uh, Zechariah 2, 4 through 8, it reads, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. Now think about the final application of this. I will be into her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwells with the daughter of Babylon. In other words, come out of her, my people. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory has he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. You know, he said that uh, the blows that were meant for thee have fallen upon me. He so closely identifies himself with his people, with you, um, that he will be wall of fire round about. Heavenly Father, as we contemplate the blessings that you want to uh, give to your people, uh, we see that there are times when walls were right to be built, and we see that those were moral walls, but we also see immoral walls built with untempered mortar um, that were meant to be pulled down. Help us to know which these are. Um, help us to uh, have your wall built around us, uh, that you are our strength and our bulwarks, but also um, we seek to bring as many as possible within that ultimate wall destination uh, now we're called racist if we believe that a nation should have borders and walls, but they're only those that are part of your, and I will say your merit-built uh, uh, plan of immigration into that city are going to make it. So help us um, that we uh, can retain or have our names retained in the Lamb's Book of Life and also uh, to yoke up with you and your work, to be about that business of seeking those that are lost and trying with all our strength, and we know that yours is infinitely higher, but as yoke to you, we know that those numbers can be built up, and there will be many that will come out of Babylon in this coming last call. So 
may your words be in our mouth. May we speak those words. May they be able to discern that you are in us. I pray that we can grow in this uh, prerequisite of a Christ-like character. Please guide us to this end, and thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Very good. Thank you, Dean. Okay. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, speaking of the... Uh, um, that topic that's that's that that gets people kicked off certain platforms you know a lot of a lot of stuff you said but it's so true that when you when you speak of the uh the walls and and illegal um peoples going into uh certain mm -hmm. countries and it, it's so similar to that of uh the kingdom of god and that you cannot enter unless you are truly uh naturalized and uh and you have the We're seal naturalized <laughs> yeah yeah and and you have his name written on your forehead in the in the law written in your heart and and uh people in, in on earth entering some some countries are are not that way so it's uh you know, when i was in Dude. mexico yeah yeah, Dean, 90 more than 90% of the people coming across the southern border are Catholic. Mm -hmm. And this is why that when you see the uh, White House and Congress saying we're going to stop them, they're, that they're not going to stop them because their master of the Vatican wants it open for more Catholics to come across to make this a Catholic nation. That's been their dream for a long time. Yeah, my family wouldn't be here had it not been for that. Uh, you know, during the Irish potato famine, <laughs> a lot of us came over, you know, well over 100 years ago. Um, now, I tried to keep names out of it and even names of certain conditions. <laughs> but uh, hopefully that that flies well. But well, um, that came that came from a, a, a YouTube that I saw about seven or eight years ago by a Catholic priest that was talking about that. <laughs> Also, uh, talking about these these little girls, you know, what's not talked about at the border is that there's nurses. And everybody that comes, they're assessed for lice and parasites and everything. All the childbearing females are also given uh, a pregnancy test. And that's for that very reason that you talked about. Yeah. Um, they're saying that... Uh... They're taking away the DNA test to find out uh, that if the child that's coming over is actually related to the person that's bringing them. And in many cases, they're not. And um, there's an estimate of a bare minimum of 30,000 a month that just disappear once they come over. Uh, there's some things that I wanted to share. I mean, they're very distressing to me. I've got, I don't have any kids of my own, but I got a real heart for them. And uh, it just uh, uh, eats me alive. But uh, it's, it's kept tamped down to where the average American doesn't know about it. There's it's just, being kept, it's being kept from them. Yeah. And if they knew, <laughs> you know, would there be, uh, I should hope there would be, but would there be any effectual protest? Um, and that's what Protestants are about. <laughs> you don't have well, to take up arms. I can tell you because my wife is from the Philippines. All mm -hmm. the medical testing they had to go through, including tuberculosis, all that stuff they had to go through before they was allowed to come to America. Yeah. You know, uh, before I... I, I worked at Hope International back in 95 to 97. And when 